Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In previous episodes, we've looked at foreign troops serving in the German army. Well, in this episode, we're going to be discussing the Georgians who came over from the Russian army to fight for the Germans. A large number of who would eventually be posted to the Dutch island of Tessel to man the Atlantic Wall. When the war in Europe ended on the 7th of May 1945, the fighting on Tessel would continue for another couple of weeks. I'm joined by Eric Lee. Eric is the author of Night of the Bayonets, The Tessel Uprising and Hitler's Revenge, April to May 1945. Now, this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself who enjoy the show and help me Find the time to put it together by becoming patrons, by committing to pay a dollar or two via Patreon each month. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. If Patreon is not your thing for whatever reason and you would like to join the gang, go to ww2podcast.com forward slash support and you'll find more information on how to support the show via PayPal. In doing so, if you check the box to be added to the mailing list, I will send you links to extras as and when I have them. So that's www.podcast.com forward slash support. Eric, thanks for joining us. Let's start with the Georgians. I was going to ask how did they end up fighting with the Germans during World War II, but it's, it's sort of much more complicated than that. The Georgians have a history with the Germans, don't they? They sided with them during the First World War. Why? Georgia, at the time, the First World War, was part of Russia. It's part of the Russian Empire. There were Georgian nationalists who would have liked to have left, but basically Georgia was a, you know, just a, a province in the Russian Empire. But when the war ended for the Russians, basically with the Bolshevik seizure of power and Lenin's proclamation of peace, everything began to fall apart on the margins. You know, like Ukraine fell into the hands of, of the Germans very quickly. The Turks had a border with Russia. The border was in Georgia. So the Turkish army was advancing very rapidly. And so they were battling the, the Russians there. And so the Georgians who proclaimed an independent state, it's largely to protect themselves from the mess all around them, needed help. They needed a protector. And they reached out to the Germans because the Germans were allied with the Turks and saying to the Germans, will you intervene, please, and push the Turks back and we'll be, you know, you'll be our protectors. And the Germans agreed. And part of it is Germany and Georgia are Christian countries. Turkey is a Muslim country. That, at that time in particular, that was a real issue. So the Germans felt a sympathy for the Georgians. And they, they agreed to be their protectors. And uh, Georgia has a lot of strategic you know, uh, minerals and things that Germany wanted. Georgia has access through the railways to the oil of Baku and Azerbaijan. So for Germany, it was a win-win. You know, they'll, they'll protect Georgia. They'll have a base in the Caucasus. They'll get all this lovely manganese and, and, and oil and stuff that, that, that Turkey won't invade. And, you know, no one expected that like six months later, Germany would have a war. Germany would have a war. So the, the initial relationship between Georgia and Germany in the 20th century was a friendly one. Germany of 1918 was not the Germany of 1941. It was a very different Germany. It was considered a civilized country. It was no different than Britain at that time. So how did the Georgians view the Germans after the uh, collapse of the German army at, you know, at the end of the war? Um, well, I mean, the, the Germans had to withdraw very quickly, and, and the British came in to replace them. And with the arrival of the British, I'm, I'm sad to say this to a, a Brit, but the, the, arrival, the, the British were not, were not welcome in Georgia. I mean, their behavior was unbelievable in the first few days. A lot of uh, confusion. They didn't understand that Georgia was actually an independent country and its president had to be treated with some respect. And the, the initial encounters were terrible. I mean, over time it was fine, but the, the, the Germans actually came off as the better occupiers. They didn't interfere. The British were always interfering. And Georgia was kind of a confusing country to the British and the Germans because it was a country run, run by these socialists. They were actually Marxists. But they were not communists. They were not, you know, like, like Lenin's party. They were, they were Mensheviks and they were democratic socialists. And they really believed in the democratic stuff. So a multi-party system and free speech. And they didn't have death camps for their opponents. They were very different from what the Russians were doing. And this was very confusing. The British would write about they're walking around with red flags and they have things called Soviets. But, but they weren't. They were very different. So it was all very confusing for the British. But the point was that the Georgians 
didn't look at Germans as some hostile, aggressive power. Their, their, their memory of the Germans was a positive one from the First World War. Georgia's enveloped by the uh, USSR. Uh, she's only independent for three years. So uh, how do the Georgians view the um, USSR, Soviet Russia? Well, with enormous hostility. I mean, um, the, the, the Russians were always trying to retake Georgia. First of all, the white, during the Russian Civil War, the whites were much closer to Georgia, and they were constantly threatening to invade and announcing they didn't recognize Georgian independence, and they were going to recreate the Tsarist Empire and all these little you know countries are going to be part of the empire again and so on. And the Reds were no better. I mean, they were also, were going to, you know, you're all going to voluntarily be members of the great Soviet family of nations. So whoever the Russians were, they were constantly uh, sabotaging and undermining and subverting the Georgian state. This, so it was three years of this until Lenin agreed in 1920, signed the peace agreement, said to Georgia, you know what, we accept the reality that you're an independent country like, like Finland or like Poland. We will not invade. We accept that we want to establish an embassy and we'll be friends. So they established an embassy. They recognized Georgia. They were one of the first countries to legally recognize Georgian independence. Established an embassy, brought in hundreds, hundreds of Soviet intelligence officers into the embassy and just went about planning the, the invasion. I mean, it was incredibly cynical behavior, by the way. Shockingly, right? The communists behaved in that way, but they really did. It was shocking behavior. And they invaded in, in February 1921 and put an end to this Georgian nonsense. So for Georgia was for 70 years a, a province of the Soviet Union. I presume uh, they viewed themselves at the time as a occupied province. Some did, some didn't. Obviously, many uh, Georgians, some people have criticized in Georgian history today, they talk about the period of the Soviet occupation. But obviously, millions of Georgians, you know, supported that, that government and were happy to be be part of it. So, they, you, know, I mean, you know, if France had been occupied for, I don't know, 70 years by the Nazis, people would have accepted it would become their, their, their lives. So it's not entirely accurate to call it an occupation, but they were invaded against their will. Their government was forced into exile. Many Georgians were slaughtered. It was incredibly violent. Period of the 1920s, there were armed rebellions against the Russians. Uh, there was actually, there was always terrorism in Georgia. There was always anti-Russian terrorism for years. It was never a totally safe place for Russians. And by 1991, it became an independent country again. Wasn't the uh, Russian foreign minister at one point from Georgia recently? The, the, the last one. Yeah. Um, whose yeah, name that, that, completely he, escapes me. His name was Edward Shevardnadze. Yes, he was. I mean, the most famous, sadly, sadly, the most famous Georgians of modern times were Joseph Stalin and his secret police chief, Beria, Lavrenti Beria. So these, these two characters, you know, two of the worst criminals in the history of the Soviet Union, people think of George as they think of that. You know, that's just terrible. So if we, um, if we zoom forward to uh, Operation Barbarossa, uh, the invasion of Russia, German invasion of Russia, was Georgia ever a, a strategic objective for the Germans? Yeah, absolutely. And, and German armies were, were racing to get to Baku for the same reason the Germans in, in 1918 wanted to be in Baku because, because of the oil. So the Germans were racing toward the Caucasus. Had they not taken a detour in Stalingrad and decided, you know, we can, how, how hard could it be to take Stalingrad, right? Had they not made that mistake, they could actually probably have made it to Baku. They just had to cross the Caucasus Mountains. So they were definitely, that was part of their, their route. They didn't make it. They made it as far as the mountains. They barely made it over and were repulsed. So how did they get into the German army? How did they get to fight with the Germans? As you know, when Barbarossa happened, it was an enormous military victory for the Germans, something that's largely forgotten. Now we see it as this, it was a disaster. In the long run, invading Russia was a disaster. In the short run, it was the biggest victory the Germans had ever won. And they, they, the speed at which they raced through Russia, and through, actually through Ukraine and Belarus into Russia, was so fast that they captured staggering numbers of Soviet troops. I mean, literally millions. Every single one of those soldiers was disobeying one of Stalin's orders. Stalin had ordered no one was to surrender. The last bullet was to be reserved for yourself. You were never to raise your arms and surrender to the Germans. That was considered treason. So millions of them committed treason. That they, you know, they raised their arms or they, whatever, ran to the Germans. When the Germans had these prisoners, millions of them, who in the first few months they were starving them and treating them appallingly, and many, many, maybe most of them died fairly quickly, but they began to segregate some of the nationalities. They started with the Ukrainians and the Belarusians because they had this theory the Ukrainians and Belarusians would, would be sympathetic to the Third Reich. 
they, they hated Stalin, they hated the Russians. And they began saying, and they even sent some of them home. There were famous stories. And they, they, people would queue up at the camp saying, I'm so-and-so's wife and would take it. They were lying. They were just, because they were giving it for a period where they let the Belarusians and Ukrainians go home. And the Georgians were separated and put in special camps. And the Germans had a theory that they could use the Georgians, that they could be reliable, they could become part of the army. And they basically made them an offer. And the offer was starve or fight. You know, you'll die in these camps. You will never be treated well. Or put on a German uniform and you get a, you get a meal. And they would tell them what the meal was going to be. We're going to serve you. You know, we have a lamb tonight, you know, with hot roast vegetables. And they really, they played to that. It was really a hunger was a central issue for them. And there's a story I tell in the book of, of I think it's a German officer, is addressing, they line up, you know, like several hundred Georgians in a, in a camp. German officer addresses them and says, all of you who oppose the Reich, Step forward. Each one opposes the Reich. So no one moves. They know the Germans are just going to shoot whoever steps forward. And the officer looks at them and says, congratulations, you've now completed your induction into the Wehrmacht. <laughs> they're, they're, so they're being pragmatic rather than being uh, anti-Bolshevik or uh, extreme nationalists. Well, yes. But first of all, remember, there's, there's a Georgian emigre community in Western Europe, a lot of them in Germany. And some of them have become sympathetic to Hitler in Germany during the 30s because they think they're going to liberate the Soviet Union. So some of them become active with the Germans and they go to the camps. They can speak Georgian and they help recruit them. And there's some of them actually wind up in the, in the Georgian Legion, but the, their numbers are small. They're insignificant. They're the only ones who actually believe in the German cause. All the other guys, they just want a meal. You know, they want, they want to get out of the camp. So the, the number who, for ideological reasons, were in the, in the, serving in the German army was very small. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of these foreign legions are not necessarily as uh, large as uh, the, the the phrase legion might might first make them sound. Um, how how are they officers? Do they have their own officers, their own Georgian officers, or 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 they have uh, German officers in command? I only know really well the story of the eight hundred and twenty second battalion, which is the one that my book is about. But there's a German officer in control and Georgian officers under him. At least one one of them is an officer. They have command over their own men, but the German is on top. And there's going to be linguistic issues. They have to, they can't communicate generally directly with the men. The men don't speak German and they don't speak Georgian. So they, there's a kind of a layer between them of Georgian officers and NCOs that they rely on. They're first deployed in the east. How, how do the Germans use them? Do they put them on sort of on the, on the front that's driving towards Georgia? Yeah, they, they use them as part of the kind of invading force that was going to, going to cross the Caucasus. Some of them were in the Bergman battalions, the, 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 the mountain troops, so the elite units. And the idea was that they could go in behind the lines and they could you know, blow up bridges and, and do all that kind of stuff. Almost like almost like the, the SOE, right? They were like a version of the SOE. Uh, the problem was they weren't actually that loyal to the Germans. So you know, you'd send 50 of them out and they wouldn't, they wouldn't come back. They would just they'd defect because you know, the Soviets would also offer offering them a hot meal and a bed and, and so on. The, and this disloyalty was something that Hitler personally anticipated. It's one of the interesting things I stumbled on it when researching the book was Hitler, you know, would have these, um, what should we call them? He'd, sit, he'd have his generals sitting around the table and he would lecture them for hours. And he, he talked at length about the Georgians and the others from that region, from the Caucasus. And he, he said that even though the Georgians are Christians, and yes, to their credit, and they're not Russians, we cannot trust them. He says we can trust the Turkic peoples, like the Azerbaijanis, they're fine. Where people from Turkmenistan, or whatever, but these Georgians are not to be trusted. Now Hitler was, you know, usually didn't know what he was talking about in these things. It was just making stuff up. In this case, he was actually right. I mean, the Georgians were really were not trustworthy for the, the Germans, as the Germans found out to their sorrow. So even in their initial deployment on the Soviet, you know, against the Soviet armies in the Caucasus, even then they were not entirely trustworthy and could not be relied upon by the Germans. So these guys are transferred to the West, which is interesting because I think uh, a, a lot of the other foreign legions remain in the East uh, because they're more ide ideologically motivated. Um, so how are they intended to be used in the West? Well, I mean, initially they get it's a whole bunch of stages. They spend some time in Crimea where they're defending Crimea and then they it's a period where they're in Poland and there's some discussions what they actually did in Poland. Uh, it's said they were involved in anti-partisan actions. Um, Georgian nationalists today deny that. They say it's absolutely made up communist mythology. And then they wind up in France. And some of them, some of them wind up in the Netherlands. And they're, they're in defensive operations. They're there to you know, build the Atlantic Wall, defend it, staff it, 
against the possible invasion. Some of them are involved in, again, anti-partisan actions. There are stories of some examples of um, barbarous behavior by the Georgians, as by all German troops during the occupation of France. But basically, they're in defensive positions along the Atlantic Wall, waiting for the Allied invasion. Um, so, so where is Tessel? Where, where is it located? What's, is, it, is it of any strategic importance? You know, there's a string of islands that starts with Tessel. It's the southernmost. It goes all the way up the coast, the Dutch coast, and along the German coast. So some of the islands are German, higher, you know, further up, further north. So this is the largest and the southernmost of the Wadden Islands. It's a very short you know, ferry journey from, from the Dutch coast. It's large. It's uh, famous for, I think, it's, its sheep. It has some nice beaches. It has no significance that, other than its position. It's on the coast. It's, it's as significant as any coastal part of, of France. So because the Germans, and this is the point people today looking at don't fully get, you could argue, why were the Germans building all these fortifications on the Dutch Wadden Islands when the invasion was in Normandy? Because, of course, they didn't know the invasion was in Normandy. So, stu- and not stupidly, they had no choice from, from Norway to Spain they had to build an Atlantic Wall. It was an enormous waste and had men deployed throughout the war along these coasts that were never threatened. So the Allies, of course, never came near this island. It wasn't in there. To the Allies, it was not a strategic space at all. It had no value. So what's life like on Tessel for the, uh, for the Georgians? Okay, so they get there, I think, toward the end of 1944, beginning of 1945. They are, I would say, you know, the second luckiest Wehrmacht troops in the world, the luckiest ones or the ones um, in, in the British Channel Islands. And I, I, wrote, I wrote about the uh, Sark in this experience, because the ones in the Channel Islands would never bomb, and they would never take danger, they had tons of food. They really did very well. These guys also did pretty well. There was food. The, the, the islands did, you know, the Netherlands suffered terribly from starvation toward the end of the war, but not these islands. They had all their own, they were agricultural islands with small populations. Uh, children were brought there for safety during the war. So it was a very safe place, and... These Georgians wandered freely around the island. This is a really important point that, again, some of the revisionist Georgian historians aren't entirely getting. They tell the story that shortly after they arrived, one of the Georgian leaders, Evgenia Artemidze, later claimed to be like the commissar of the, of the, of the Georgians, wanders around, knocks on the door of somebody and says, I understand you're the leader of the, the resistance. You need to chat. I mean, first of all, he's wandering around because, you know, we well, can get to it later, but the, the mythology is that these guys were prisoners of war. Which of course they weren't. They weren't. They wandered freely around the island. They looked like another German soldier, and they knew all kinds of stuff that they were absolutely um, equal to the Germans. How they were treated, and the Germans treated them largely well. There's not a lot of complaint about how badly. In fact, the German officer in charge, Major Breitner, took his Georgian adjutant with him when he would go to Germany on holiday to see his family, and he, he would stay with the family. So he felt, you know, we were so nice to the Georgians. Why did they behave so badly toward us? I think they were well treated. I think they had a good time at Tessel. And some of them had girlfriends, and some of the girlfriends became pregnant. And people on the island will tell you now, you look around, you can see which ones are from the Georgians, because they don't look like Dutch people. How, how were relations with the uh, Dutch? Were they seen as being separate from uh, the Germans, or were the Georgians tarred with the same brush as the, as the Germans? No, they, they, they were part of the German army, was seen as part of the German army. They, they were understood to be different. Most people would call them Russians. As was all over Europe, there was no understanding that these were not actually Russians. Um, they were just seen as German soldiers, except that the, the Dutch resistance understood the difference. And they had, had meetings with Dutch resistance before they came to Tesla. Right? Like on the mainland, they had made contact not just with the resistance, but specifically with the Dutch Communist Party, because they had a common language, the language of international communism. And this is a really interesting part of the story that lots of people do not want to talk about. But the Dutch Communist Party, if I can go on, the Dutch Communist Party played a, a terrible role, certainly in the first two years of the war, like every other communist party in Europe, because the Soviet Union was in alliance with Hitler for the first two years of the war. So these guys were, ne- were not part of the resistance until June 22nd, 1941, when suddenly the Nazis became bad guys. Previously, it was fine. So they had a, a skeleton in their closet, the Dutch Communist Party, that their, their wartime record was not a good record. And also from the even in the relationship with the Soviets, who funded them, of course, they hadn't really done very much. Certainly from a military point of view, we don't speak with the heroism of the Dutch resistance and all the Germans they killed. They really didn't, as opposed to, let's say, the Polish resistance, which made life for the Germans hell. This wasn't the case generally in Western Europe, and particularly in the Netherlands. So these Georgians met the Dutch Communist Party, and they were so thrilled 
we have hundreds of Georgians who are armed to the teeth, possibly willing to rise up and kill the Germans. And, you know, we can we, we can take credit for it. We can be part of that. So it was it was a you know, marriage made in heaven and they got along really well. And when they were sent to Tessel, there were very few communists, but they met them. And they, they had, you know, they continued to liaise and talk to the Dutch communists about when they should rise up and how. And they had a crazy plan to march on Amsterdam. And they thought that all the East European soldiers in the Wehrmacht, you know, the Russians and the Georgians, the Ukrainians would all join them. They'd buy, and they'd, they'd deliberate the Netherlands. That you didn't even need the British. They'd do it themselves. It was very naive, their ideas. With the end of the war looming um, by April 45, the writings on the wall, where does that leave these Georgians? Presumably... From a Russian point of view, they're traitors. From the Allied point of view, they're uh, Germans. And from the Dutch point of view, they're occupiers. So, so they don't have many cards to play with. No, they don't. And, and, and the Germans have made a point of telling them that it's not a secret. Stalin has said that you guys have betrayed your country twice. First, you surrender to the Germans. That already means you're going to you know, wind up in the gulag. Best case scenario, you'll be in Siberia. But you've also put on the German uniform. You fought on the German side. So... You know, your, your future is not bright when you return to the Soviet Union when the war ends. The war is going to end soon. They also, Germans also, also told them that one of the consequences of the Yalta Agreement was you're all going home. You, you can't stay here in the Netherlands. Germany, we can't take you in as, you know, as like, you know, we do in Britain now with the Afghans. Or, no, no, you're going back to the Soviet Union. You're going to be, they're going to welcome you there. They knew this. They knew this. And this was very important in their thinking. But the war is going to end momentarily. Uh, we cannot be proudly serving in the German army on that day. They, they were aware of this, and there was a question really of timing. What would trigger them to, to rebel, to have a mutiny? And the, the Germans provided them with cause. So, so they, uh, they do rebel. Uh, what, is, what is the catalyst for, for, for them rebelling? The, the catalyst is the Germans do something incredibly stupid. I mean, the Georgians are basically relaxing on Tessel, right? They're just guarding these German installations there. At their dev, their girlfriends, everything is fine. They're, they're basically all sitting out, waiting for the war to end. You're talking early April 1945. The war's end is imminent. They all know this. But the Germans send orders to Major Breitner on, on Tessel. They say, take half of your battalion, those Georgians, to the mainland and go to Arnhem. Arnhem, where, where Market Garden, you know, ended badly. Go to Arnhem because we're fighting the British and Canadian forces there. We need every, every soldier we can get. Take them over there. So Breitner passes on the orders to the Georgians like in the late afternoon, like tomorrow morning, you know, six o'clock, and you have the guys to go down to the harbor, get on the boats, we're going over to fight the British and Canadians. Just what you want to do, right, if you're a Georgian. The Georgians meet in one of the little woods. The Tessel is not a very heavily wooded island, but there's some woods. There's a wood where they meet. And their leader is Shalva Loladze. He's like a lieutenant or a captain. He'd been in the Red Air Force. He's the commander of the senior Georgian commander. There's Artemidze, his deputy, who's like the political commissar. Slowly, they're all communists. They're all loyal to the Soviet Union. We're going to go out. We're going to help the Soviet Union. We're going to be part of the allies who liberate the Netherlands. And they decide that night, now we begin. We, we call it Operation Day of Birth. And what we're going to do is at 1 o'clock in the morning, we're going to um, raise the alarm. I forget what it was. Like a fire with flare or something. I think it was a flare. And every man is going to know what he has to do. And what they have to do is there's 800 of them. And there's, there's not that many Germans. That they, you know, a certain German army men, this German navy is another issue. German army is fairly small. It's 800 of them, and they share the same barracks. They're in the same bunkers, which are all over the island. Every man knows which German he is to kill. And they have to kill them silently so they won't arou- you know, raise the alarm. So they tell them, you're going to use your bayonets, your knives, and your shaving knives. And I've seen a Russian army shaving knife, a Red Army shaving knife, looks like it's quite a deadly weapon. You're gonna, and you're going to, while they're sleeping, cut the throats of the Germans. This is the plan. And, and as, as we succeed in doing that, we're going to seize control of certain strategic assets in the island. It's really a wealthy, they've been planning this for months. And the Germans have given them the, the excuse. The Germans have told them, you know, in the morning. You're, so they're up and awake. And the Germans think, well, they're getting organized. They're like packing to go tomorrow morning. It hasn't crossed their mind for a second that the Georgians are scheming to slaughter them in their beds which is what they, what they do. And they kill an estimated 400 German soldiers the first night. by slow sessions. It's a tremendous number. It's a, the number of Germans they kill overall is a multiple of the number of Georgians who die. But the ruthlessness of it, because these are men they've been living with, in some cases for years, they've been serving in the same army. I mean, this is an extraordinary moment. This, the brutality of this fight on both sides. 
and the book I describe is it's like the Eastern Front being played out in the West. It's Eastern Front mentality, it's complete ruthlessness on both sides. They don't quite get a full grip on the island that first night, even though there's uh, 400 sort of Germans uh, slaughtered in their beds. So why do they fail to, uh, to, to get a grip? Well, the, the, first, let's talk about what, the, what they succeeded with. They, they captured the airfield, the airfield in the middle of the island, which is very important because they, they, they're hoping British planes will land. You know, the British will find out what they've done, how hard it can be. The war's effectively over. The British will walk in, accept the Germans surrender. That's their, that's their plan. They've taken the harbor. They, they've taken the center of the island, which is, there's a town called Den, Den Borg. I, I'd say Den Borg. It's in Den Borg. There's a Dutch way of pronouncing it. It's the main village. They've taken control of that. All, all the bunker, the whole bunker complex, which the Germans commanded from, they've taken that. They missed two things. First, the German commander, Major Klaus Breitner, is not in his barracks where he should be. Breitner, according to his own recollections, he survived the war and he wrote a lot about his experience there. He says, yeah, the medical condition that required him be somewhere else. The islanders say he was with his mistress, his mistress in the town. And I was taken, I was shown, that's our house. The house is still there. That's the house he was sleeping in. So they missed him and he was awakened by the noise of shooting. Some shooting did begin. Obviously, it wasn't entirely silent. And he found another officer was with them, and they walked over toward the main complex of their, their bunkers, their command headquarters, where they heard shooting, didn't know what's going on. And Breitner says to the other officer, go ahead and walk in front of me, see what's happening. And he gets, the other officer gets shot. I said, Breitner understands it's a dangerous situation. I mean, can you imagine if you put somebody else in front of you to find out if it's dangerous? And then Breitner goes, basically crawls his way to one of two naval batteries on the island. There's one in the northern tip and one in the southern tip of the island. These naval batteries, which hold these enormous naval guns to fight against an Allied invasion fleet, are controlled by the Navy, the Kriegsmarine, not by the Wehrmacht. So the Georgians can't take them. They can't get in. The, these German naval personnel refuse them entry. And so, you know, they can throw grenades or shoot at them, but these are fortified installations, barbed wire, and I mean, so they can't take them. So, so Breitner escapes to one of them, I think the southern battery, and he, there he gets off a radio message to Berlin explaining what's happened. The Georgians have risen up. They've mutinied. They've killed almost my entire force of German soldiers. You know, terrible thing. The batteries are able to turn their guns inland, which previously apparently been impossible. They were designed to fire out at sea, at, at ships. These enormous weapons, they do direct them inland. And Hitler, in the bunker in Berlin, I'm imagining the scene in Downfall, right? He's sitting there in a bunker. He no longer has armies to command. He's going to be dead in, in what, three weeks, silly? The war's finished. The German army can't do anything. And he hears this and becomes furious because it's a mutiny of men in German uniform, men who've taken a personal loath of loyalty, loyalty to him. So he sends an order to do whatever it needs, whatever it takes. I want these Georgians to be annihilated. Every man, no mercy, kill them all. That's the order. And that part of the Netherlands, there is still a German army there. The Allies have bypassed this is the western part of the Netherlands or the northwestern part. The Allies, up there, the Allies are racing toward Berlin. They're trying to get to Arnhem and, and, and cross the Rhine and reach Berlin as quickly as possible. The war is effectively over. They're not even paying attention to what's going on in Tesla, but they're still German troops. So he deploys, they start landing German troops in large numbers with tanks. Some, some accounts say they were SS, but whatever it was, large numbers of Germans start to land. And these naval guns within hours begin pummeling inland. First, first, the main town, bombarding it ruthlessly. And I, I was populated with civilians, large numbers of defenseless civilians. Many, many of them died the first day by this German onslaught. What surprised me was that uh, considering they're losing in the West, that uh, you know, Hitler decides to send more troops to uh, an area that's not really going to help, help win the war. It's not going to affect the outcome of the war. Exactly. I mean, a rational thing to have done would be to say, okay, so we lost Tessel. You know, who cares? Right? It's a tiny little island in the hands of the Georgians. Who cares? No. Hitler was, he took this personally. It's really, and, you know, when Hitler gets angry, he's, you know, becomes nasty, you know. So he did, um, it was a very foolish thing to do. And also, but most of these Germans, or a significant number of them, were sent to their deaths. This wasn't a simple, we're going to mop up the Georgians. I mean, these Georgians were ferocious fighters, as they discovered at their cost. How, how did the Dutch feel about these Georgians? Because I guess on the, from one point of view, they're liberating the island. Um, 
but on the on the other side uh, of the coin, they're um, they're bringing the war to the island. You know, it, it had otherwise been peaceful. Well, exactly, and and there was, um, I mean, there were several reactions. The initial reaction was on the morning on the morning after the, the this night of the bayonets. The morning after the, the Dutch took out their flags and they greeted the Georgians as liberty. As if the Americans had arrived on the island, they actually. So they, we had allied troops on the island. They found Soviet flags or red flags, put them out, and began celebrating. The war was effectively over for them. So the initial reaction was, this is great. That only lasted a few hours. Then when the German retaliation began, many Dutch people's view became, wait a minute, you couldn't have sat it out for four more weeks or three more weeks? I mean, the war is ending. If you had done nothing, you Georgians, we would all have survived the war. That was their thinking. But the Dutch Communist Party was thrilled. This is the best thing that ever happened. They were so excited. They thought this is going to be great for everybody. We're going to come off as heroes. We, you know, kill we, we the communists, but Georgians and, you know, and uh, Dutch people together took on the, the fascist beast and we killed the hundreds of them. That's, that's going to be their spin of what happened. So the conflicting Dutch narratives also depends on when you talk to them. But many of the islanders themselves, and there was a documentary done not long ago where they asked them, people saying it was just, we hated the Georgians for doing that. Because it was very peaceful and calm. If they just stayed put, everything would have been fine for us, which was true in many parts of Europe. You said before that the Georgians held the airfield, um, presumably with the belief that the Allies might come and support them in some way. Why is it the Allies uh, don't arrive? I, I presume they, uh, they're they aware of what's going on? Yes. Now, first, the Georgian, th- their idea was they're going to get hold of a radio and they're going to broadcast, they, they thought, to England and say, we've liberated Tessel land a plane here to receive the German surrender. That was how they expected it would play out. And, and, and that's why they held the effort. They held the effort for many days. I mean, they thought that at any moment the RAF is going to land a plane here and, and we'll be fine. The radio didn't work. They couldn't get it to work. And they thought, oh, you know, what are we going to do? With it? They'll never know what's going on here. Of course, they didn't realize the Allies knew in real time what was happening at Tesla because of Enigma. They intercepted. And I've read the messages that they were decoding very quickly. And they knew, oh, look at hundreds. It was a big deal. There's a lot of traffic, you know, radio traffic about this. So they knew, like, in the day it happened, what had happened, and did nothing initially because this, this was not of no strategic importance to them. They had no forces to deploy there. They weren't thinking in those terms at all. So the Georgian plan B was if we can't radio them, and they, of course, knew nothing about Enigma, we have to inform them. So we'll pick three or four of our guys, we'll put them in a boat and race over to England. So they put them in a boat. I mean, they, they had this life, what they call the lifeboat, of maybe, I don't know, 10, 10 people on board, half of them Dutch. And these Georgians were in German uniform and took them like 24 hours to make, to make the, the English coast. They reached um, the coast of, of Norfolk. You can imagine the surprise of these, you know, dad's army coast guardsmen. It was a very curious story. But anyway, they, you know, they landed to tell their story, you know. But of course, the Allies already knew. And the Allies took no decision to come at any point. They never even considered it, I think going there and helping them. It's amazing that they didn't uh, just send over some, I don't know, air cover of some description. I think they may have sent one plane like to look at it, like a spotter, have a look, see what's going on. But sent no one. And literally, at that, that point in the war, probably a few Allied soldiers would have arrived and the Germans would have surrendered to them at that point. So, no, they didn't consider it. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, places in the war where the Allies didn't intervene because it wasn't part of the plan. And the plan was very focused and in the war as rapidly as possible. And this was, this was not going to help with it. So they, they didn't help them at all. They got nothing. Now, you mentioned before that the Georgians had been used in um, anti-partisan uh, uh, roles. Now, they're effectively, they're almost opposite operating as par- partisans. They, they, uh, they've reversed their position from you know, how they're operating in Russia. How effective were they? How, had they learned a thing or two? Well, that's the irony, right? They, they became partisans. Because once the Germans came there in strength, they were forced to flee the main village and to hide out in the little forests and the farms and the, in the canals and the ditches and, and the beaches. They found all these places to hide and they fought partisan warfare. One of the more amusing things that happened was they apparently used to um, show themselves as being terrible shots. And there were stories, Dutch people say they, they, they seemed not to know how to hold a rifle. They would never hit the things they were shooting at. They really played this role. And then the minute they rebelled, it turned out they were all sharpshooters, you know? which freaked the Germans out. The Germans were afraid of getting near them. So the Germans used these incredible tactics to avoid giving the Georgians a chance to take shots at them. 
because they, they, they were just terrified of how accurate they were going to shoot. Now, now the war ends on the 7th of uh, May, and there's, there's leaflets dropped all over the island to tell the German forces that the war's over, and pres- presumably um, they'll have heard it on their military radio, and and also it'll be on their you know, public public broadcast far and wide, so it should be pretty well known that the, the war's finished. But the fighting doesn't end, does it? Why, why do the Germans persist in trying to... Uh, uh, track down the Georgians. First of all, I mean, the war ends in the Netherlands even earlier. On May 5th, it's like three days before VE Day, the, the German armies in the Netherlands surrender. So they know, they're aware of this. From their point of view, it's sort of like, we would like to go home, to go back to Germany. We know the war's over, but while we're here, these crazy Georgians, there's about 200 of them left, are hiding in various places and they're shooting at us. You know, it's, it is, it's a partisan war. It's a, a war of attrition that's going on. And they, the Germans know very little about what's actually going on. At one point, they killed the Georgian commander, Loladze. He's hiding in some building. They, they suspect he might be there. They burn the, they're burning a lot of the farms, hoping to burn the Georgians out. The Georgians run out. If the Georgians are captured, the Germans make them strip off their uniforms because you can't wear a German uniform when you've done that, and then they shoot them. They take no prisoners at all. So they, they kill Loladze after a couple of weeks, but they don't know who they've killed. And these Georgians by this time are in ragtag uniforms. They're filthy. They've been hiding in ditches. They don't know who he is. So they start putting up posters around the island saying, you know, we'll pay money to find the whereabouts of Loladza, who's dead. Right. So their, their intelligence is terrible and they're scared to death of these Georgians. What's interesting also is the Germans remain a um, disciplined military force until the very end. I guess this is probably true all over Europe. They obey their officers. They do not mutiny. They trust the officers. And they're, they're sort of gathering together and trying to defend themselves, terrified that the Georgians will kill them. So this war goes on for two weeks after VE Day. There's not a lot of shooting going on, but the Georgians are taking pot shots at the Germans. The Germans think the Dutch are waiting, praying somebody will come here and get both of them off the island. And then, then the Canadians arrive. The Canadians, is their, it's their part of the Netherlands. They've already had their post-war parties. They've been partying in Amsterdam. They've been in victory parades. You know, the war, it's like, imagine this is two weeks after the war's over. Everywhere in the world, people are snogging in the main squares, getting drunk. And a couple of them land on the island, and they're they realize this craziness is still going on there. The war has not ended on this island. And the Canadian commander writes in his war diary, this is, this is what I found was a musical comedy situation. That's how we described it, musical comedy. The craziness of it. The Germans are terrified. They're, they're saying to the, you know, the, the Canadians, we will leave, but you have to guarantee our safety. You know, like as we, get to the boat, we want to carry our weapons with us. All these crazy things. They're scared to death of these Georgians. There's only about 200 Georgians left out of the 800 that have started. How, how do these Canadians view the Georgians? Do they see them as being Russians or do they uh, just sort of lump them in with the, with the Germans? No, they understand that they're Russians. I mean, they've, they've made that, that leap. They understand that they're not Germans at all. They're, they're Russians. Later on, they may grasp that they're, they're uh, Georgians. But they do some phenomenal. They like the Georgians. They, they treat them as they are allies. They hear this from some of the Dutch people that these guys rebelled and were part of the Allied forces fighting the Germans. And they, um, first they, they take the Germans off the island fairly quickly, like within a day or two. But the Georgians, they allow them to collect their dead, to create the Georgian military cemetery, to have ceremonies to honor their dead. The Georgians are, you know, telling their story to the Canadians. And the Canadian commander, General Foulkes, writes this letter to the Soviet armies, which is to go with the Georgians when they're repatriated, saying... We found them. This is the situation we found. They fought heroically against the German Nazi beast. Um, we think they should be treated with, you know, accordingly. When they arrived in the Soviet Union, we consider them part of the great Allied effort that has won this war. And Eisenhower sends essentially the same letter shortly after. The Canadians must have passed it on. So these are two letters in the archives to the Soviet leadership saying this. So the Georgians sold their story of, of their heroism. which It was heroic. And the Canadians were part of telling that story. And the Canadians decide they have to send someone there to take charge of this. Like this, the, the guys who were doing it was like some regiment of the artillery. They need somebody more serious. So they find the son of the governor general of Canada, the governor general, former governor general who had died, John Buchan, the guy who wrote the 39 Steps and all those other famous novels. His son is also a Buchan. He's, he's sent to Tessel to handle the Georgians and get them off the island, get them to where they belong. He's a bird watcher. So he goes to Tessel. And writes an article in August 1945. This is right after he writes a big article about Tessel about the birds and photographs of the birds he saw. I mean, he's, he's out of his depth completely. There's no, there's no what's going on. 
they tell the Georgians, you know, um, you, you cannot take your weapons with you when you get on the boats. We're going to send you back. You're going to go you know, meet Soviet officers. You know, we've written a letter telling them that you're great. You can't take your weapons. They say, OK, no problem. No weapons. They get on the boat and the, the British and Canadian officers tell them, OK, empty your pockets kind of and all of the weapons on them. And they started throwing hand grenades in the water. They were really crazy, you know, um, drunk with victory. What what happened? Uh, and from that moment, the mythology of this rebellion is born. Now, I'm right in saying a lot of these men were forcibly uh, repatriated. They had no choice but to go back to Russia. Um, now, they're not treated too badly, I think, when they get back compared to some of the others. Does this mythology of them on the on the island fighting uh, give them a level of respect that travel ho- that travels home with them? Yes, and, and I think it starts, in a sense, with these letters from General Fulks and from General Eisenhower, uh, it, telling this story, which is not entirely true, of how these, these guys were, you know, part of our great Allied cause. Yeah, they were for the last month of the war, you know, the entire rest of the war. They were in German uniforms. And they tell that story in the Dutch Communist Party, which is a, quite a large party. It wasn't before the war, but like many communist parties, it built the mythology of it, its own roles, like the French or, or Italian communist parties became enormous after the war. And the Dutch... Less so, but that was their goal. They're going to portray themselves as we were in the front lines fighting these Germans from day one, sort of. And they um, they help create this myth. So within a year, a year later, when many, many people, who, uh, Soviet soldiers who had fought in the German army have been sent off to the Gulag or killed, or, the Georgians are back home, mostly. Some of them have been sort of taken to Siberia for a bit, but they're back home. Some of them apparently were, were taken to Azerbaijan. And they, you'll be punished. When it's and they could walk home, which they did. They walked, as I it's not that big, they walked back to Georgia. And they resumed normal life. A year after this rebellion, the first, for, the, the, for the first anniversary of it, the Soviet ambassador shows up in Georgia, in Tessel, sorry. Soviet ambassador, who's Russian, goes to Tessel and they create this monument and memorial to the heroic anti fascist fighters who, the mythology is, were prisoners of war who somehow got hold of weapons. It amused me that there's a, a, a film made in the 70s, which is, again, that uh, uh, the Russian POWs rising up uh, against the oppressor. It's an extraordinary film, and, and for my sins, I had to watch the whole film. My, my, my Georgian publisher found it on YouTube, and we spent an evening, she, she interpreted me watching this awful, awful, one of the stupidest films ever made. And apparently the actors... The Georgian actors, and it's done in Georgian. They make it clear they're Georgians, they're not Russians. They're open about that. They're all these incredibly good-looking young men. They all take their shirts off, you know, and, and there's one beautiful blonde girl looks at them. The Germans are all these short, ugly men in the film. So it's, you know, the Georgians tower over them, you know. So it's quite a ridiculous film. It's a completely inaccurate account of, of what happened. Um, it really does show them that they're, they're POWs. They figure out a way to get hold of weapons. Of course, they're not wearing German uniforms and, and so on. And, and, they, and the British betray them. You know, they, they show them like at the beach just waiting for the British to arrive and the British never come. You know, they've been lied to and so on. So it's a ridiculous movie. It was actually shown on Tessel. They did the Western European premiere on the island. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, yeah, and, and it's not unusual for the Soviets to rewrite history, but this is a really weird rewriting of history because these are guys who, from a Stalin point of view, were criminals, betrayed the Soviet Union. But kind of hard for Stalin to accept how many of his citizens were disloyal to him during the war? That was a problem for Stalin. There were vast numbers, right, who helped to help the Nazis and even fought in their, in their armies. I looked into the case of the Vlasov army. You know, Vlasov was the Russian general who formed a little army fighting the German side. They were executed. I mean, they were not treated with any mercy at all. So um, these Georgians got off very lightly. Well, as I say, I, I think they played their cards uh, very well from their, their point of view. Uh, possibly at the expense of the Dutch civilians. but well, I had the uh, privilege you know. of, um, through the, the daughter of, of Artemidza, who survived, he was like the highest ranking Georgian who survived. I went to the house, and they had a house in the, in the mountains of Georgia, somewhere, a little village, and one of the rooms is a little museum of his, his artifacts from the war. And one of the things he's most proud of is a, is a newspaper interview where, where what he said, what he said was, my uniform was Hitler's, but my heart belonged to Stalin. This was the lie. And the room is decorated with pictures of Stalin everywhere. And they did a little kind of underground newspaper for the Georgians on Tessa with a big picture of Stalin and hammers and sickles. They were so glad to be heading back to the Soviet Union. It was complete mythology. They, was, they were completely disloyal to Stalin. They couldn't care less. But that's, that's, how, that's how it was shown. 
It's fascinating because uh, then you point out that uh, Georgia obviously becomes independent and the myth changes again to become a foundation myth for Georgia, the country as an independent state. It's a very strange story because, I mean, initially there's not very much interest in, in, in Tesla. The, the Soviet ambassador is no longer, is no longer a Soviet ambassador. And the Georgians have to begin rethinking their history, right? They're an independent country. They know everything the Soviets told them wasn't true, right? So they know that Stalin was not a good guy that the leaders of their country back in 1918 and 1919 were actually um, not stooges of British imperialism, actually were good guys. They, they begin to learn the new history. This history, they like the Soviet version. So the, the famous Georgian president, the one who was in president during the last war with the Russians, Saakashvili, was actually married to a Dutch woman. So they went on, on like a private visit with <laughs> television cameras all around them. And with a, a Georgian... Um, your bishop, a priest, some high-ranking priest in the Georgian church, other dignitaries, they went to the Georgian cemetery in Tessel. And the speech he gave was like something out of the Soviet Union. These are these heroes who took on the fascist beast. He goes on and on. You're thinking, does he not know that's a made-up Soviet story? There's no truth. To you. One can honor their heroism. Of course, you should. But, you know, tell the truth about the, the complexity of what went on there. Nope. The, from a Georgian nationalist point of view, the, the Soviet mythology fits. It's, an, it's a fascinating example of how history can be used and um, not necessarily twisted, but, you know, unraveled or spun in a different way. Yeah, um, it's very hard to disentangle. It's a question when you talk to independent Georgian scholars, some of, some of the young Georgian scholars I talk to, they say there's all kinds of crazy stories here, you know, the stories of how tightly the Georgians were in fact caught up with the Germans, how many of them actually volunteered to be in elite units whether some of them really did engage in vicious anti-partisan actions, which, of course, they now all deny. Like the official lines, they were never doing any of that. Of course not. They were Georgian patriots and, and good Soviet citizens, you know, but uh, it's more complicated than that. So what you learn is you have to disentangle all this and, and you know, get, and get, get to some various, some version of the truth under these, all these stories that were told. Everybody tells a different story about what happened on Tesla. Well, Eric, that was, that was fantastic. Thank you. Loyal listener, Eric's book is Night of the Bayonets, the Tessel Uprising and Hitler's Revenge, April to May 1945. It's well worth adding to your Christmas list. I think that is all from me for now. Don't forget, if you want more World War II chat, you can become a patron of the podcast at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And if you use Facebook, why not give the page a like? I do try to post relevant things to the latest episode of the podcast. I promise I won't fill up your news feed with tat. So until next time, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.